This is the most dangerous motorsport in the world. Powerboat speed over 200 miles per hour, the length of a football field in just one second. Feel the force of 5Gs as a boat screams around corners at 100 miles per hour. Hold on tight for the ride of your life. Imagine something six times bigger than an Indy car with four times more power. These are offshore power boats. They race over rolling, pitching oceans at over 100 miles per hour. Welcome race fans, we're in store for some great racing today here on Fort Myers Beach. Jack Comedy out of Fort Myers, Florida, the opening race of this year's offshore season. One, two, one. Offshore racing covers many different categories and classes of boats. But the fastest and largest are the catamarans. This cat, named Carlos and Charlie's, is one of the race favorites. These twin-hulled vessels are over 40 feet long. The boat's twin engines deliver 2,000 horsepower. It's capable of 140 miles per hour. After a bad last season, owner and driver Jack Carmody is hoping for better luck this season. We, we actually went through three different boats last year. We settled on the 46-foot cat. We spent all winter testing. We've got the boat set up very well. And we're excited about the way our boat's performing, but also we have three other very strong competitors here. This is the man they all want to beat, world champion Reggie Fountain. No one has driven an offshore powerboat faster than Fountain. In January 1997, he and Italian designer Fabio Buzzi set a new offshore world speed record. Their diesel-powered catamaran reached an amazing 158.31 miles per hour. Fountain had thrown down the gauntlet. Four months later, at the season opener at Fort Myers, Reggie Fountain is making last-minute changes to his world record-breaking boat. Right now, his most important decision is which propeller design to use. Propellers are much like the automobile tire. Uh, you hear them talk about it in stock car racing in the United States, Formula One racing, how important the tire compound is. It's what you put the power to the road with. Well, the propeller is what you put the power to the water with. And it's just as important to a boat as a tire is to a car. The catamaran design enables it to go faster than any other kind of boat. It flies over the waves, and this reduces drag through the water. Air is drawn between the hulls into a tunnel, which narrows towards the rear of the boat. The air is compressed and lifts the boat out of the water. The catamarans are fast, but also highly unstable. The fastest you can possibly run is just before that boat takes off like an airplane. It's what I call more squirrely, harder to, hard to control, but it's extremely fast. 
which is why in many races uh, you can see a lot of crashes amongst competitive boats because the guy that's going to run the fastest is the guy that sticks his neck out just a little bit further and runs that boat just a little bit looser across the top of the water. Stick your neck out just a little too far in an offshore race and it could be the last thing you do. Water is over 600 times more dense than air, so when a powerboat crashes, it's like hitting a concrete wall. The first race of the season is about to begin. Racers face a daunting 90-mile course over 10 laps. Unlike other forms of powerboat racing, offshore boats need a crew of two, a driver and a throttle man. In offshore racing, it's very rough, very physical, and uh, the throttle man provides the function of actually powering the boat and, and trimming the boat. He is focused directly immediately in front of the boat is what he's watching from wave to wave. The driver navigates the course, does strategy around other boats, and, and focuses a little farther away. But Reggie Fountain is unique. He does everything himself. The man with the throttles and the trim is the most important thing because the secret of speed is how you trim the boat. On the other hand, the driver can kill you just as quick as the throttle man or the trimmer. The thing so dangerous that I always said, you know, if I want to kill myself in one of these things going fast and doing the wrong thing, I kind of want to do it myself rather than have somebody do it for me. Offshore racing is so dangerous, each team has its own safety helicopter. If a boat crashes, divers can jump in and rescue the crew in seconds. The fastest offshore power boat in the world has developed problems. The world record run had put too much strain on the engines. We had to rely uh, on the engines without a rebuild, and uh, they just weren't up to the strain and pain we'd put on them. So uh, we made a lap to get some points and came in. Unfortunate thing. Next race, we'll have four motors there. One race, we can stick another one in. Lap seven, just three boats left in the race. It's looking good for Jack Carmody and Carlos and Charlie's. These boats take such a pounding that endurance is as important as speed. The winner is often the last boat left on the water. Suddenly, Carlos and Charlie's is forced to drop out. Well, on the number seven lap in the back stretch, we were a uh, drag race down the back and blew a port side number six drive, broke a gear in it and dropped us out of the race. The Mercury-owned Recovery is ready to take the checkered flag when the right propeller snaps. They're out of the race, too. Recovery 
with its broken propeller, heads for Mercury's secret test site for a major rebuild. Over the next few weeks, the teams must repair their boats. In less than a month, they will meet again. In the world of powerboat racing, this is the most secret of secret locations. Codenamed Lake X, it's the test site for Mercury, the world's largest powerboat engine manufacturer. Here, engines are put through the most demanding tests, way beyond the levels of even the most grueling race. They've been doing this for over 40 years. Lake X was founded in 1957 by the man who created Mercury Outboards, Carl Kiekefer. The purpose of Lake X was to be a private test base where he could run new products or run existing products for extremely long lengths of time without bothering the public and without having the public's prying eyes necessarily seeing what projects were on Mercury's drawing boards. In 1957, when Lake X was established, Mercury set a record which has never been beaten. The company wanted to show the world that their outboard motors were the best. Two boats circled a six-mile course for 34 days non-stop, a 25,000-mile endurance test. The drivers were replaced every four hours. At the same time, the boat was refueled. They kept going, night and day, through good and bad weather. By the end of the run, they had traveled the equivalent of a trip around the world. This extraordinary feat of endurance proved to a skeptical public that outboard motors were safe and reliable. Here's one kind of outboard excitement, and here's another. Remain seated and start the motor with a firm, steady motion. You'll find all your favorite fishing features. Go modern. Go Mercury. Nowadays, we still run endurance. We still prep products for their top performance, but we also work with race teams to make sure that their rigs are dialed in the way they want them to be for top performance and durability. Okay, and when you're pointed ready, you can light it. Go ahead. Drag boat racing is all about delivering maximum power now. Drag boats can rocket a quarter of a mile in just over five seconds. Yeah, it's hanging up there pretty good, Larry. What kind of RPMs are we getting out of it? 10 four, 10 four. Top speed for a drag boat is 241 miles per hour. After each run, the boat is brought ashore. We're just going to change the fuel map on the top end here, just a few numbers to try Lake to X engineers run computer diagnostics and analyze every detail of the boat's performance. Today they've been checking engine setup, uh, propeller selections, and all the little variables in addition to the basic engine on the boat. In water racing, the difference between a winner and a runner-up is measured in tenths of a mile an hour. So they're here getting that last little edge that they hope will give them the lead in the competition. 
Mercury's offshore racing reputation was dealt a severe blow at the Fort Myers opening race when the propeller broke on recovery. She's been at Lake X for several weeks, undergoing intensive surgery. It was looking great from the outset. The engines were running terrifically. The boat was leading the pack. And six laps into the race, a blade came off the propeller. You can never be too prepared. You can never look at the molecules in those propeller blades too closely. The propeller already is back at our metallurgy lab being examined to see why that happened, to see what process changes we need to make in order to make sure that that doesn't happen again. With brand new propellers and a complete overhaul, recovery is now ready for the race season ahead. This is the ultimate marine challenge, crossing the Atlantic Ocean at high speed. Over the years, the Blue Ribboned Trophy has attracted some spectacular creations. Right, 087, England, here we come. In 1986, the English business tycoon Richard Branson attempted to smash the record. His boat, Virgin Atlantic Challenger, the 65-foot aluminum catamaran cost $3 million. After a long wait for calm ocean, the six-man crew set off from the Ambrose Light Vessel off New York. Atlantic Challenger had traveled 2,973 miles at an average of 47 miles per hour before she hit submerged debris and split wide open. The boat split. The whole of the bottom of the hull split. Split. The boat sank just 138 miles from her goal. The crew abandoned ship and were rescued by the British Navy. After clipping 10 hours off the Queen Mary's Atlantic crossing record, the United States' fastest liner in the world proudly approaches Le Havre to make her first docking in Europe, and the French turn out to give a royal welcome to the new Queen of the Atlantic. Amazingly, the record Branson was chasing had been set by an ocean liner in 1952. The liner United States made the trip in three days, 10 hours and 30 minutes at an average speed of 35 miles per hour. The Atlantic Challenger disaster didn't stop Richard Branson. With a new boat, he made a second attempt at the elusive Blue Ribbon. The Virgin Atlantic Challenger II was built with laser precision on a round-the-clock schedule. Eleven months after the first sinking, Branson and his six-man crew were ready to try again. This time they built a boat with a single hull. Seventy-two feet long and made of aluminum, this craft had innovative five-bladed propellers surrounded by semicircular rudders. The aim of this design was to harness wash from the propellers and make the boat easier to steer. Challenge number two began at 6 a.m. on the morning of June 27th. A control center in London monitored progress as the crew headed out into the stormy waters of the North Atlantic. Oh, we've got a bit of a dumping. <laughs> straight through the wave. Soaked. Branson was on track for the record when disaster struck at his second refueling stop. Seawater got into the refueling pipe. The crew had to pump the contaminated fuel out of the engines and refuel again. The problem cost them seven hours.
The boat continued, but progress was slow. The engine filters had been damaged by the contaminated fuel. The filters had to be replaced soon, or the engines would seize up. The London Control Center radioed the Royal Air Force, desperate for help. Within one hour, the RAF flew new filters out to Challenger. The drop was a success. Atlantic Challenger was back in the running. Challenger, Challenger, the Bishop Hawk Lighthouse. Congratulations. It averaged 42.1 miles per hour. It broke the record set by the liner United States by just two hours. In 1989, the record was broken again by the American Tom Gentry in his boat, Gentry Eagle. This 110-foot-long, 11,500-horsepower craft smashed Branson's record. It made the 3,000-mile crossing in two days, 14 hours, and seven minutes at an average speed of 55.6 miles per hour. Inshore racing. These are Formula One powerboats. Just 17 feet long, they accelerate from zero to 100 in less than four seconds. Top speed, 140 miles per hour. A boat that takes 90 degree turns at breathtaking speeds. Inside a cockpit modeled on an F-16 fighter, the driver controls the machine with pinpoint accuracy. The slightest mistake could mean death. This is the most dangerous form of powerboat racing on Earth. To win and stay alive demands total concentration. The Formula One boat is a pretty unique animal in the fact that you're doing something with both hands and both feet at all times that you're driving the boat. And it's nothing more than an airplane that you're trying to fly just above the water. Although you have to keep the propeller and the gear case in the water for stability because if you lose total contact with the water then it becomes like a leaf and whatever direction it takes off in is the direction it's going to go. If you feel it lifting, you're probably going to go over. Formula One boats are made of fiberglass, carbon fiber and wood. They weigh a mere 350 pounds. When they crash, there's not much left. Bill Siebold is the most successful driver in the history of Formula One racing. His two sons, Tim and Mike, follow in his footsteps. You gotta make sure you get that off. Okay. Well, they both have grown up around the sport, as I did. Of course, not Formula Ones. I grew up back when my father was running at 60, 70, 80 mile an hour speeds and kind of loved the sport. Uh, they love to go fast. Just kind of, I guess, runs in the Siebold blood. The most critical skill in Formula One racing is knowing how to corner the boat at high speed. When you're running on the straightaways, you want to run with about two or three feet of the boat in the water. If you try and turn it like that, 
As soon as it dumps the air, it's gonna barrel roll in the corner. So what you wanna do is you trim the boat down, the engine comes in, sets the front of the boat down, and then you can turn it. Once you turn it, you're on the up button about halfway through the corner to get the boat back up to accelerate, which trims the motor out. The first race of the season is at Wichards Beach, North Carolina. The first task is to reach the official qualifying speed. Boats race against the clock, not against each other. But even during qualifying runs, disaster is never far away. Coming right down the front straightaway. The racer is lucky to be alive. We're trying to hold it together and keep it up high and keep it out of the water. That dog leg, I think we set the boat a little too hard. It caught too much water. <laughs> Brought the boat to an abrupt halt. Okay, let's put our hands together for him. He took a rough one out there. Tough way to get applause, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> the drivers line up for the first semifinal. Tension is high. Formula One racing has a nerve wracking start. All the boats are lined up with the engines off, and we have a uh, one minute uh, starting flare. One minute, drivers, one minute. And then there are, they'll have a countdown to 20 seconds, and the end of 20, at 20 seconds, there'll be a flag man out in the boat in the center of the race course will raise a flag. 20 seconds, the flag is up. We are under starter's orders. And any time from 20 seconds to zero at his discretion, he can drop it. He's the only guy that knows when it's gonna drop, so you cannot anticipate the start. The start is the most dangerous part. 20 boats, all trying to reach the first turn ahead of the others and then hold the inside lane, the shortest way around the course. The semi-final is over 15 laps. Each lap averages between 30 and 35 seconds. Unlike car racing, where the cars follow in each other's slipstream, it's far too dangerous for Formula One power boats to do the same. Only one half of the propeller is in the water, and each boat throws up a 100-foot rooster tail of spray. The spray is so powerful it can smash windshields and turn boats over. The rough water also presents a major hazard. A spectator tapes driver Ben Robertson's crash. The wind started getting up and there was a lot of rollers coming in, a lot of boat waves, and uh, got a really good start coming across that line and the boat tripped off some rollers right at that right hand dog leg and it just nosed in. That's called a stuff or a nose dive. And about 120 mile hour stop and uh, 18 feet. The safety capsules are really do their job and uh, that's what they're here about. Otherwise I don't think I'd have been here now. A collision with an inexperienced driver also forces Tim Seabold out of the semifinal. We were coming up on some back markers. I went on the inside then, and I got about three quarters of the way past him, and he didn't look on the inside, and he turned into me. With only an hour to go before the final, Tim Seabold has no chance of repairing his boat. The two boats barely touched, but the damage was severe. 
This is the final. Mike and Bill Seabold are in the first two lanes. As they scream around the corners at 100 miles per hour, the drivers experience forces of up to five Gs. As the race progresses, Mike Seabold opens up a huge 28 second lead. It seems he has won. But with just one lap to go, and Mike still in the lead, the race is stopped by a tragic accident. 53-year-old James Howenstein was dead before the divers could get to him, killed instantly by the terrible impact. Unaware of the tragedy, the other racers are made to restart. 20 seconds, the flag is up. Let's hear it. In this two-lap sprint race, a disappointed Mike Seabold could only manage third place. I thought it was pretty much a done deal, I mean, but we had a crash and with a half lap to go and for some reason, out of the blue, they decided they wanted to restart the race with a half lap to go. They wanted to make a two lap sprint at the end, I had a little too much water in my boat, wouldn't take off with the other guys and I ended up third. Every time a Formula One driver climbs into the cockpit, he's acutely aware it could be for the last time. The best learn from past mistakes. That, that drives any kind of racing vehicle that does not fear it will ultimately get hurt or go over. And I think you have to learn the point of no return when you go over that one time. That's a pretty fine line because, you know, that's why they call it racing. If two of you guys are running down the straightaway, one guy is always going to try to push a little harder into the corner, fly the boat a little higher, you know, and that's where you get in trouble. But if a guy knows his limitations, most likely he's going to come out on top. It's possible to have ultra high performance in even the smallest power boat. Jet skis work by sucking water through a high-pressure pump and pushing it out through a nozzle. This jet ski can do the impossible. Lloyd Burlew is a champion stunt driver. To perform his tricks, he's had to make some modifications to his machine. In this particular boat, when you do tricks like I do, we spend a lot of time underwater. What we try and do is we block off a lot of the air intakes on it. Uh, we also modify the motor. I want a lot of propulsion immediately, not so much top speed. These particular models are capable of doing speeds of 62, 63 miles an hour when they're fully modified. <laughs> the Power 360, that's one of the moves that I invented. I do it one-handed and two-handed. It's when you come in, you carve the boat, and you really do a power turn and let that whole boat spin on a dime. <laughs> the most difficult stunt I do on a watercraft, I'd have to say, is my handstand. It takes a lot of balance. something I learned when I was really young. Woo! The submarine, that's another crowd pleaser. That's when we take the boat and our body and submerge it completely underwater. <laughs> we can draw as much as 15 foot of water before we actually touch the bottom. 
Okay, big trip coming up. The barrel roll is, is a trick that the crowd really likes. It's when you spin the bow completely upside down and around, do a cylinder roll in the air. That takes a lot of power in your legs, a lot of power in the motor, and that's a dangerous trick because you are flipping the machine over your body. I'd say that's probably the most dangerous trick there is. It's a hard trick, it's just something you have to commit to. Now people are starting to do it one-handed, no-handed, and everyone's pushing the envelope here. The it's like the new trick, score higher. So everyone's trying to come up with their new stuff, but the aero barrel roll right now is gonna be the one to push the envelope this year. For pure speed rather than maneuverability, you need one of these. The unlimited hydroplanes, the fastest power boats on Earth. They reach speeds in excess of 200 miles per hour. They're raced exclusively in the United States. In the last two decades, the sport has been dominated by one team, Budweiser, and their boat, Miss Bud. They've notched up 16 world championships and 103 career victories. But in 1996, a new name appeared on the winner's trophy. That season, Team Pico American Dream stormed the championship with six wins out of ten. Stunned at losing the title, this season Budweiser is fighting back. They've hired Pico's 96 champion driver. Dave Vilwak is under enormous pressure to succeed. With the vast resources of Budweiser behind him, failure is not an option. His boss is used to winning. We have an image and, and uh, we have a lot of fans and we don't want to disappoint the fans. They expect us to win and that's the only way to be here. We're going to win. And uh, second or third is not in the book. The teams assemble at Norfolk, Virginia for the opening race of the season. Although the Budweiser team faces stiff competition from several quarters, the real grudge match is between them and the Pico team. To ensure all teams start equal, all unlimited hydroplanes are powered by identical engines, a 2,650 horsepower jet turbine, the same engine used to fly a Chinook helicopter. This awesome amount of engine power will spin the propeller at over 15,000 revolutions per minute. It consumes fuel at a rate of a gallon every 15 seconds. Miss Bud goes out on her first test run. It's a time for the team to experiment with different setups and for the driver to get a feel for the course. Budweiser has two boats to choose from. This allows the team to select the right boat for the course. We need to get uh, either the back stretch caught up with the front stretch. Okay, the wall went across, and we get 99 to go across to the back stretch so the help. We ran a 154, you know, about a 154, I'm told. So, you know, that's a pretty good speed here in testing. This water's a little rougher, so, you know, speeds are going to be held down just a little bit in top qualifying, but, you know, really happy with the boat. Crew did a great job, you know, right out of the box. Brand new boat. Congratulations, Dave. For the Budweiser team, perfection is everything. We'll change engines, gearboxes, propellers. We'll change all the things, all the things we can because we're racers. We're never happy. No matter how fast the boat goes, we're never happy. 
Following Dave Vilwalk's departure, the Pico team has signed up Mark Evans, the Budweiser 1996 driver, one of the most experienced racers on the circuit. Pico team owner Fred Leland has had to rethink his strategy for this season. Our driver went to work for Budweiser, and they seem to have a boat that's awful close to the one we had last year. So we figured we needed to try to build something better. Pico is hoping that their new driver's willingness to take extra risks will give them the edge on Budweiser. We're going to have to get right close to the limit. You've got to break the boat loose of the water. Uh, the water, when you're touching the water, that's drag. So you want to fly the boat, get the boat up over the waves. It actually makes for a smoother ride and you have good acceleration. Uh, to do that puts you into the danger zone, but I'm just have to, gonna have to drive uh, my heart out up in that area to be able to catch the Budweiser at this time. Firing up these beasts requires a surprisingly light touch. It puts the start button down, that starts spooling the engine up. And then we have this other little button that says fuel. You spray a little fuel to the engine, that ignites the engine. You just keep playing with that. And you just kind of touch it just a little bit at a time as the engine starts spooling up, finally ignites. Uh, you have a throttle on your right foot, just like in your car. You push it down, farther down you go, the faster you go. On your left foot, we have two pedals. One's for up and one's for down. As you're going along, you're coming out of a turn, you can push the down pedal, push the flap down. That starts to lift the boat up, give you some lot of lift and a good acceleration. About halfway down, you better start getting off of that thing. The boat's really starting to fly. If the boat starts to lose control, the driver has less than a second to hit the up pedal, raising the flap and bringing the boat back down. The Budweiser team has made its boat selection. Driver Dave Vilwak now has to qualify. Before entering the heats, a boat has to qualify with a minimum average of 130 miles per hour for one lap. If Vilwak fails to reach the speed within three laps, he faces disqualification. His first try, 125 miles per hour, isn't good enough. Come on, Dave. 128.5 miles per hour, still not there, and only one lap left. He's on it now. Bill Watt has to really push it now. He's in the danger zone. Oh, That's enough. Pulling the boat back from the brink on the last turn, Bill Watt finishes his qualifying round. He qualifies with a speed of 146.8 miles per hour, but the boat's engine is damaged by the intake of water. What happens is the salt water will kill the engine. As the boat accelerated away from the pit area, salt water spray from the rough sea was sucked into the engine. Although the engine survived the qualifying session, it's only a matter of time before it breaks down completely. The Budweiser team is already committed to racing this boat. There's less than an hour to replace the damaged engine. Pico's season is not starting well either. A host of technical problems has prevented the boat from even testing. Mark Evans has to go straight for a qualifying run. The boat's engine fails to ignite. 
I just had the pedal mash down, and then all of a sudden the thing just slowed down. Well, I let up and tried it a couple times, it, it felt like it wanted to take and, and go. And then it was inconsistent and started gradually slowing down, and it just, there was nothing on the pedal. I'm going to have to get out there and swim around, I think. We'll see. <laughs> no, I think the crew was going to try to get as fast as they can back in the water, and we'll go out and run again. Finally, Mark Evans manages to fire up the Pico engine. Despite atrociously windy conditions, he clocks up a qualifying speed of 144.8 miles per hour. The bad weather is making it much more difficult for the other teams to reach the qualifying speed. And he cuts the race point, he's pointing right into a very, very strong wind, and there's a dangerous condition there. 128.104 miles an hour, something just blew off the boat. A portion of the cowling just blew off the boat. Those that do qualify have one more test to pass. To ensure that no one is cheating, all the hydroplanes are fitted with black box recorders. From them, race officials can monitor every aspect of a boat's performance. The close call team is the first to be checked. We'll start tracking across. Here's accelerating out of the corner, up the back chute. Here's going into the second turn. Here's down the front chute into the first turn again. Okay, I'm seeing no what we would define as an occurrence. An occurrence is any time the RPM of the engine exceeds 110% for more than three seconds, the time that the boat recorded is accurate and is not going to be challenged. Perfectly legal run. To reach the final, the boats must first race in heats. Bud driver Dave Villawa, the fastest qualifier, takes the inside lane and leads the pack. Mark Evans of Pico, in second place, chases Villawa all the way. But Vilwak holds him off, and Miss Bud takes the first heat. Locked in high-speed combat, drivers give little thought to the well-being of the boat. You know, I don't know how fast it went, but we don't really have any instruments in the cockpit. You know, all I have to, we aren't going to turn it off anyway, we don't care what the oil pressures are or anything else, we're going to run it until it quits. So, whatever it takes to win. Through the heats, the boats battle for supremacy. Their goal, to make it to the final and capture the all-important inside lane. Every driver knows the risks of pushing too far, but it's a risk they all take. Some have gone as close as you can get. As you're flying through the air, it's quite a sensation and you just hope you don't hit real hard. But there's a lot of water, a lot of noise. And sometimes it can actually feel like you're slow motion flying through the air in an accident that happens to a lot of guys. It's a real phenomenon. This is the final. Budweiser's persistence pays off, and they take lane one. Before these racers can even think about overtaking, they have to be five boat lengths ahead. Anything less can end in disaster. Mark Evans in the Pico takes a direct hit from an illegal move. first turn and uh, tried to stay tucked in to, and the guy outside me, Nate Brown, uh, in his boat, just so happens he hooked it about the same time. His boat came around and hooked and then he went to straighten out and he just bammed right into us, which caused this right here. And when he did, he kind of cut right under us and I rode right up on the rooster tail and 
and it took a wild ride, but part of racing. With Pico now out of the race, Dave Vilwak powers Miss Bud to a comfortable victory. We knew we had to stretch it out on the boys there to sort of put them away there in the first lap. Sort of like a prize fight, you know, when the guy punches the guy the first time and he's got to sort of rock back on his heels, you know, he's got to put in the second and third punch to get the knockout, and that's what we were trying to do, and we had to run the boat real hard to do that. But luckily, kept the boat on the water, came out champion. Three weeks after his victory, Dave Vilwag fractured his arm in a terrible crash. He was out of the championship for the rest of the season. The Budweiser team replaced him with another driver. Whatever the driver's experience, whatever the discipline, when winning is everything, there's no room for mistakes. The split-second judgment of the driver can be the difference between winning and losing, and the difference between life and death. Only the most daring, only those prepared to take enormous risks, will succeed at this unforgiving sport.